Well, I'm delighted to welcome everyone here today for this conversation about some new data that I have um, on the state of government organization and capacity. We've got a wonderful uh, crew of, uh, of conversationalists and experts uh, to talk a little bit about what we're finding as we reach election day. Uh, so I've been collecting data for some years now on a set of trends, and I'm going to show you some slides shortly uh, before we get rolling. Um, we have uh, uh, a small group of commentators and friends, starting with Katie Dunn Tempus, who is at Georgetown, uh, and Brookings Institution, one of the nation's leading experts on the presidential appointments process. Danielle Bryan from the Project on Government Oversight, arguably one of our very most important, if not the most important uh, oversight and monitoring uh, uh, organizations in Washington, and Tom Shoup, uh, editor in uh, excellence at uh, Government Executive Magazine, a dear friend uh, from years and years of uh, work on covering government, and there's no better uh, magazine outlet uh, in Washington by my count. We have the support of NYU's uh, outreach team um, who helped pull this all together and I'm delighted to introduce Tom who's going to moderate uh, this conversation. Thank you Paul. Um, it's great to be here uh, with all of you and Paul you're going to kick us off right by walking us through some of your data, right? Right. Uh, Kevin, let's uh, put this up here. Uh, this uh, webinar and uh, an article that I penned for Government Executive, uh, looking at these uh, six major trends, only five of which are uh, featured in the article, basically is updating a long stream of research that we've been doing dating back to trend lines uh, beginning in 1945. Most of them are fresher than that in terms of their start date, but we've got uh, recent data on uh, the major trends we're going to talk about right now. Let's go to the first trend, uh, the, the list of trends. Um, we've been monitoring now for some years uh, the public demand for reform, which remains high. We saw a spike in public demand for what we describe as very major reform in the early 2000s and we've inched up uh, slightly from the early 2000s. We'll talk about that shortly. The number of federal government breakdowns, failures, if you want to just uh, cut to the chase, has been going up. We count failures in terms of public news interest in a story, along with a clearly defined cause and effect that shows government did not do its job uh, well. Number three, we have measures of federal bloat, which we mean by which we mean the layers at the top of government and the number of occupants per layers. We have estimates of the true size of the federal government's blended workforce of federal civil servants, active duty military, postal service employees, uh, and employees funded under contracts and grants. That has reached a near record high uh, under our most recent estimates. And number five, um, we have estimates of how well Congress is doing in producing the kinds of high quality, high impact reforms that we need to keep government uh, working effectively. So I'm gonna run through these very quickly. Uh, Kevin, let's uh, take a look at the first. This is a simple chart that shows the level of public demand for very major reform. We see that in 1997, uh, the level of demand for reform was relatively uh, calm. But uh, following 1997, I'm gonna pull this over so I can see it just a little bit uh, better. We see a steady uptick in the amount of public support for very major reform, as opposed to governments working pretty well and doesn't need much reform at all. And, uh, government is doing just fine and doesn't need any reform at all. We see this spike by the mid-2000s, and we have seen very little change since. Donald Trump comes into office saying that only he 
uh, has the knowledge of the system needed uh, to improve it, and hence, he alone could fix it. At least by the public's measure, the federal government still needs very major reform. There's partisan influence on this measure, but there's no evidence that the American public is thinking that the federal government is doing just fine anymore. The number of Americans who say that it's working pretty well, doesn't need much, remains steady and much lower, and there's hardly anyone in our surveys that suggests the federal government doesn't need reform at all. Next slide here. Uh, I count the number of highly visible breakdowns that the American public is paying attention to. And if you can uh, click uh, into this slide, this is the list of breakdowns under Donald Trump. It's a record setting pace. Now by breakdown, I'm talking about events that the American public are paying close attention to. These are arguably and strongly uh, argued failures of government performance. Not because the federal government doesn't want to succeed, not because the federal government intends to fail, or so to speak, but because something goes wrong. And we go all the way back to 1986 for the start of this trend line with the shuttle Challenger accident. We have the problems dealing with Hurricane Katrina, and then again with FEMA after Hurricane Maria. So this is a list of failures, and to the right side of the chart, you see the percentage of Americans paying attention to the failures. Next chart, my friend. We see that the average number of failures per year has been going up. Now, you can see that Donald Trump has set a record in number of failures per year. That's not all of his doing. One can make a credible argument that the federal government has become more error prone over the last 20 to 30 years because of negligence on the part of presidents and congresses to fix broken systems. In other words, Donald Trump has contributed to the number of breakdowns, sometimes through his own casual uh, response, his own lack of interest because of problem appointees and so forth, but sometimes because the federal government has become more error prone. Technologies ancient, uh, civil service aging, systems broken, and Congress does not show much interest in fixing what's wrong with government. Inspectors general tossed aside. Let's go to the next uh, uh, slide here. Uh, this is a slide, uh, show both of the, uh, of the charts. These are measures of bloat, number of layers between the top of the federal government departments, the 15 cabinet departments, and the bottom of the executive level five appointments. What we do is we look at the federal phone books and we count department by department, agency by agency, how many layers there are between the secretary <clears throat> at executive level one and the bottom of the executive level hierarchy, which is executive level five. And we basically say, how many layers are there? And you can see that the number of layers has gone up since 1960 and the number of occupants per layer. In other words, government's getting taller and it's getting wider. This creates all sorts of issues with the transfer of information up and down the chain of command. It's like the childhood game of telephone and gossip. The information goes up, it gets distorted, it moves sideways, it goes up, it goes down. Bureaucratic bloat by these measures is at its highest level today in more than 40 years. And Donald Trump uh, uh, sadly deserves credit here uh, for becoming the king of bloat in, the term, in terms of the number of layers between the top and bottom of the federal government. Uh, he came in promising to get rid of all those needless layers of people over people over people. And what we see from these charts, which are built on hand coding of the federal phone books, we have more people over people over people than we did at the beginning of the Trump administration. Next chart here, please. Uh, we have new estimates now based on the true size of the federal government. Danielle uh, can help us understand it. 
Uh, there was a promise made uh, by uh, President Trump before he entered office that he was going to cut the size of government. But what he did was hide the true size of government. The number of federal civil servants in this table to your far right of the table has not moved far at all. We did not get a significant reduction in the number of federal civil servants. In fact, there's been a tiny increase. The real growth in the federal government has been among contractors and grantees. The defense spending records being set uh, account for much of this growth. The point here is that the federal government's estimated true size, its blended workforce, is now near the same level the record setting level uh, in the days after the, uh, the 2008-2009 economic recession. That was when Obama was throwing everything we had, the Obama administration, at getting people into jobs. And now, uh, just a few years later, we are nearing a record in terms of total federal blended employment. We can talk about how those estimates were made, and Danielle can tell us with whether contractors bring us efficiencies as the president office tell, often tells us he does. Uh, next chart, please. These are the actual statistics on the number of uh, jobs created and filled in the various compartments of the federal workforce. And you can see the growth. Uh, and I think we have another slide here. Um, I argue in this slide, and I'm just gonna pass through it that the federal government uh, is now operating without much deep supervision by Congress, and we haven't had major reforms of big systems for decades now. It's been 40 years since the Civil Service Reform Act under Jimmy Carter. It's been many years since we last uh, rebuilt the whistleblower protection system. The inspectors general appear to be at large now in terms of protections from uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, Senator Grassley has done his best to provide protections, but we need an update in our systems. And of course we have the GAO, Government uh, Accountability Office, uh, annual high risk lists. Congress needs to get back to work on fixing government. And my point here is that Congress right now is doing more tinkering been repairing, and I argue in my piece for government executive uh, that the time for major reform is clear and Joe Biden needs to talk about it. If you listen to the debate last night, if you've been following the campaigns, there's very little talk about where, how we're going to repair these broken federal agencies. And that is the first job, because I will guarantee to everybody listening here that the first major breakdown that will face Joe Biden, if he's president, will be next spring. Not two years from now, but next spring. We are on a roll of breakdowns right now because we haven't done the maintenance uh, for a good 10, 15 years. That's where I'm gonna stop here and we can turn this over to my dear colleagues and friends. I'm counting you as a friend, Tom, so that's a good thing. Well, you've made my day. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's up to you now, Tom. First off, I should have mentioned at the beginning that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please do uh, enter your questions there and we'll reserve some time at the end for that. I wanted to start with Danielle because Paul just brought up something about true size of government and the contractors and mentioned that you are very familiar with this phenomenon. What's would Americans be shocked if they knew just how big the federal government was? And what's the impact of that? I do think that, uh, well, they shouldn't be shocked because Paul Light has been leading the way on this particular question for a long time. They are not, the, the, the general understanding of uh, the federal government is focused on civil servants and doesn't take into account those other categories that Paul very uh, importantly adds to the picture. The contractor workforce is the one that we at POGO have been most worried about, in part because they're less accountable, uh, but more importantly, they're just a lot more expensive. And, and the thing that I think is really important, as Paul is pointing to uh, a potentially a Biden transition, is I, I want them to be 
learning some of the mistakes that the learn from some of the mistakes that the Clinton administration, uh, uh, the Clinton Gore administration, when they were having their reinventing government efforts, uh, they really believed that bringing in more contractors and outsourcing a lot of public sector work was going to make things more efficient and less expensive. But Pogo did an analysis, which Paul, it was almost 10 years ago that we did that analysis. It was a huge report doing as best we could with the apples to apples comparison. And we found that on average, contractors cost the taxpayer nearly twice as much as federal employees for exactly the same work. And in some cases, it's three to five times more expensive. So the notion that it's more efficient is just, is just the facts show that it's just not, it's not true. Paul, is that does that trend just stem from the sort of ironclad political rule that thou shalt not increase the size of the civil service? Um, I have a chart in one of these reports that shows the enduring impact of something called the Witten uh, Amendment in 1950. We imposed a 2 million FTE cap on total federal employment uh, in 1950. Um, and that cap, that 2 million number, has worked its will long after the cap was repealed and repealed again. Uh, there seems to be this notion that you can't cross the two million number um, or you know, it's gonna be defeat for you. Uh, we do not do head to head. There's been a long fight on Capitol Hill led by Chris Van Hollen to get the Congressional Budget Office to at least make an estimate of the number of heads that we cover with contracts and grants the Congressional Budget Office repeatedly says, we can't do it, there's no data. Well, there is data. We know how much we spend on every purchase we make. The uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis has good estimates of what those dollars buy in terms of labor hours. We can do this. And when we sit down and say we have to cut the federal government workforce by X or Y percent, all of the federal workforce should be part of the dialogue, but that hasn't been the case. And that number, it just won't go away. It just won't go. I'm always astonished in our work at Government Executive how deeply embedded contractors are in federal operations now. Many, many times they're working side by side with career government employees, and it's difficult to even tell who's a contractor and who's not. Yeah. And Tom, I would just add um, to the discussion about sort of this notion of keeping the government lean and mean, that many times presidential candidates will make these promises, like I'm going to reduce the size of the White House staff by 10%. I think they think it makes it look as though they're being very efficient and very good about running government. But they, in the end, what always happens is they come up with some sort of creative accounting, whether it's through detailees or obscuring the public's ability to get the information about how many people actually work in the White House. Um, but again, it's sort of this, you know, instead of sort of talking about what do we need to run the government well, what do we need to run it in a way that we're not relying so much on these outside contractors, they don't get to that at all. It's all about running a lean and mean operation and, you know, to heck with the numbers, we'll figure out a way to make it look good. And um, this has been going on since the Carter administration, at least. Uh, and so it's a real problem that I think, um, you know, maybe if there's a way we could sort of change the incentives so that presidents and their campaigns don't feel... Um, like they have to make those kinds of hollow promises. On that subject, relative to Paul's point about increasing number of layers, you've done a lot of work on staffing at high levels of administrations mm -hmm. and pointed out that the, the Trump administration has left an astonishing number of these positions unfilled. So is layer that big a problem if there's nobody in a lot of these jobs? Well, Trump is clearly unique in this respect. Um, he has essentially hollowed out the government. There are numerous vacancies at the highest levels of government. And um, oftentimes what they do is it's, sometimes I think it's neglect. Sometimes I think it's because the pool of recruits was very small to begin with and there's not that many people who are qualified who want these jobs. Uh, but I also think it's the case that many of the, the people that are loyalists to the president cannot get through the confirmation process. And so what he does instead, like he did with King Cuccinelli and others, is he creates these kind of um, sort of not by the book ways of appointing people to non-Senate confirmed positions 
and then letting them fill the position as an acting. And they can do that without the Senate confirmation process. There's all kinds of loopholes in the Federal Vacancies Reform Act. Talk about trying to motivate Congress to amend something that has so many loopholes. This is another great candidate for that. But um, you're right, President Trump has simultaneously hollowed out the government, but then added contractors. So, you know, explain that. Paul, so is, if they're leaving a lot of these positions unfilled, so is, is the layering thing only a paper problem? Well, the, the problem is that the email still goes to a destination. The information flows are hardened in a concrete. The, the information flows up the chain of command. If there's nobody there to handle it, it doesn't get passed forward. That's the game of gossip or telephone that the children play. Uh, Anthony Fauci, if you want to get him by telephone, from uh, Pennsylvania, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and you have to call all the way down to his office, 19 layers on its way down. Now, that does nothing to accelerate the movement of knowledge. I mean, in theory, the way you're framing the question, it's not a bad thing to have all these vacancies, except that law says the vacancies must be filled and the signature on that policy must be from a properly credentialed individual. That's why we now have a case moving through the courts uh, involving a acting appointee who exceeded the amount of time uh, in office allowable under statute, who has made a series of decisions that are now considered null and void. Suddenly we're in a situation where doubt about who's in charge and who has the authority brings the federal government to a halt. Now, is that intended by the Trump administration? Some people in the Trump administration don't mind if the federal government stops working. I mean, what's the big deal if decisions are null and void? But from a constitutional standpoint, seems to me that we want to make sure that if you're going to delay or de facto, you got to follow up and delay uh, from a formal standpoint, and there's none of that going on. I, I would agree with the point you're making, Paul. And it, it is it is very clear that some of these agencies are uh, a deliberate effort to both avoid uh, Senate confirmation, avoid accountability, keep people in who are, are loyalists, who often don't believe in the mission of the agency that they're working in. And so I think that's another element of what we're seeing in this administration that's, that, that's unique again, as Catherine said, I think to this administration, is so many people who are put at the top as actings of agencies that, that are deliberately trying to sort of break or undermine the, the functioning of those, of those agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then finally, I would just put in a plug for a recent report that Brookings did along with the Partnership for Public Service, where we look at these vacancies and we try to figure out why there are so many, we do some case studies. And one of the things we find is that there are sometimes it seems intentional not to staff certain um, agencies or departments that are sort of a lower priority for the president. And that's just not right. Um, but again, it's how do you incentivize Congress to, to close these loopholes and to stand up for their own institutional responsibility in the sense that these nominees should be going through the confirmation process and getting a vote in the Senate. And that's not happening. And in many cases, there are, there, there are people who Republicans in the Senate have made it clear they're not going to support and they find some other way to install them in an acting capacity. You know, way back when, uh, uh, when John Glenn was running the Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, we rescued the Vacancies Act from the dustbin of history and his view was if you don't want to fill it, get rid of it. But that's not what we've done. Um, we want the vacancies filled or get rid of them. If you want a delay or then do it uh, deliberately. Uh, but that's not what's happened. We've got these appointments all over the place. And, and, and you know, Katie is the, the world's expert on this. Um, and we could use this Biden if he was interested, if he, if he is elected and he wants to do something he might take a look at the vacancies that have existed and say, well, maybe we don't need that political position. But Lord help him if he starts talking about getting rid of political positions with the uh, 
pent up demand for appointments uh, from Democrats, he's going to have a lot of trouble with it. We need something deliberate to get sort of clean out uh, commissions of one kind or another. I have a friend, Philip Howard, who talks a lot about the need for clean up or clean out commissions in state and local government. Um, maybe we need to be thinking about that. Um, and what we found is there actually, oh, go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. I was going to say, we actually found that there were some positions um, that were difficult to fill in Republican and Democratic administrations. So that gets to Paul point, Paul's point that maybe there are some positions that shouldn't be Senate confirmed. And I think the last time that the Congress actually put some close scrutiny on, can we reduce the number of Senate confirmed positions? They did that in maybe 2011 or 2012, but it's high time, I think. And, and one set of offices that uh, I certainly hope we aren't eliminating, but are suffering because of these vacancies and sort of the abuse of, of vacancies are the inspectors general, as Paul oh. referenced in this administration, we've had um, you know, totally inappropriate uh, removal of inspectors general, putting in people in as actings. And in some cases we have uh, ongoing political um, uh, allies who are now both sharing the role in the management of an agency and an acting IG, which is a completely preposterous uh, scenario. So we have a, a lot of reforms that need to be um, addressed in the next administration and, and top of my list in that, in that sense is to protect IGs from the kind of removals that we've seen in this administration. When you think and, and look back to major statutory reforms of how government works, you know, we're looking back at the last major review now 25 years ago. Uh, when Al Gore and Elaine K. Mark and this wonderful group of people came together to take sort of a top-down uh, look at how things work. Whether you agreed with what they did or not, they were serious. They took the hard look. Uh, they examined closely. Then you have to roll back from 1995 and reinvent it. You've got to go back to Jimmy Carter with the waves of reform that came during his administration. A government as good as the people. You know, a government that pays attention to what citizens need and want a fair amount of statutes that are now ancient. And I'm saying that uh, not to confirm that I'm ancient, but you had ethics in government, whistleblowers, the inspectors general, all of these statutes. And now we're kind of tinkering to repair them as we can. And Lord love um, uh, Senator Grassley for trying as he can to fix the inspectors general appointments process so that if you fire one, you got to tell Congress why you did it. And now you got to tell it why you did it and when you did it and so forth. But that ain't going to protect the inspectors. You know, that's an ancient statute that needs to be brought into current tense. But, you know, what we got now in the congressional committees, governmental affairs now spends most of its time in the Senate working on homeland security. And government ops, government reform in the House doesn't have the staff that it used to have to mount significant investigatory action. The big place you go to for reform right now is GAO and terrific agencies should have a louder voice on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that a strongly worded letter from Chuck Grassley isn't enough to... Well, that's right. You know, I'm from, I'm from South Dakota and we always listen to Iowa. You know, uh, you know, that's the promised land for a South Dakotan. He has been a tireless advocate. He's fought some big battles over this. And I'm, I'm hopeful that he'll come forward with uh, some pretty deep uh, reforms in the future. But, you know, we, we just haven't tended to these statutes that make such a big difference. We just haven't done it. I am optimistic when it comes to the inspectors general, there is bipartisan interest in the Senate and, uh, and in the House to really look at how to better protect uh, uh, inspectors general. We believe strongly that they should be given for cause protections, but there are, there are other ways we could be managing this and, and they are being taken seriously. If we could get movement and actual legislative um, activity again, I think we could get somewhere. I, I've thought uh, from time to time that we ought to try the GAO, the Comptroller General Appointments Mechanism, uh, which has this odd little character to it that 
Congress creates a commission to recommend names to the president for appointment. That kind of crosses a couple of lines, right? But we've got a great CG uh, in Gene Dodaro who came through that process and Elmer Stott, some of the giants of uh, monitoring government. Uh, maybe we need an entirely different uh, process. I, I just don't know, I'm gonna trust you and Katie and others mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to weigh in on it, but this ain't working. It's just not and, working. And I would just add that there's a lot of reasons we are where we are today. But one I think we can't overlook is that members of Congress have no incentive to work on government reform. It's not as though they're constituents. I know that Paul's general pub data shows that there is interest in reform. But I mean, members of Congress, their constituents are interested in new bridges, better schools, you know, the basics. And I just think there are collective actions in, in Congress, of collective action problems in Congress Nobody really cares about the institution anymore. Nobody cares about protecting its prerogatives and its constitutional powers. It's more about how can I get reelected? And it's hard to create, um, you know, short of major crises like we had in 2000 with the election or right now maybe with the pandemic, uh, the 9-11 um, attacks. Short of events like that, it's very difficult to motivate members of Congress to focus on reform. Um, and one might think now that with the forthcoming election and all the concern over the, the appropriate counting of ballots and things like that, in addition to the pandemic, that that might be able to motivate Congress to start to think about some of these weaknesses that they have in the government. But I'm not super optimistic. Well, to give a little op uh, uh, optimism, Catherine, I was excited to discover there's a study that's been done by Chatham University in, in California for the last seven years they've been looking at what are uh, people most afraid of. And for the last seven years, it has actually been corruption in government that has been the number one issue above even job and food security. I was really astounded. And I think part of what we need to be doing is better articulating that the reason these really wonky concepts like inspectors general matter is they're an anti-corruption force. They're the people who are the front line making sure that government is doing what it does. And I think some of it is on all of our um, responsibility to better articulate why these offices really matter and why, why they should matter to people who are busy you know, with their lives. So Paul, your overarching theme is fix government fast. Has anyone ever actually fixed government fast? <laughs> well, I think you, you know, it'd be nice for our candidates to talk about uh, the need to do some of this, the need to repair. Um, I'd like to see more coming from the Biden campaign on these issues. I understand that they're, uh, although uh, I like this Chatham, uh, Chatham House or, or Chat Chatham University, correct? Um, this study, uh, you know, can it be done fast? If you don't do it, you're gonna be in repair mode fast. So the president, the next president, uh, the incoming president, needs to talk about all these breakdowns. And we've seen a cascade of breakdowns um, associated with COVID. We had the IRS checks to dead people. We've had problems with moving supplies and so forth and so on. I think the American public is pretty fed up with it. And the next president should be leading on government reform, it's, it's, it's broken, but have I ever seen it fast? You saw some major surges in policy in 1977. Carter did come in. He did lead with an ethics and government agenda. He did lead with reorganizations. We broke up HEW and created a Department of Education. Was it the right thing? I'm not sure, but Carter came in, he said, we're gonna do this. Um, where he got into trouble uh, later on was in economic management with the misery index of inflation and unemployment and so forth. But Carter was able to push ideas forward and he got some major reforms done. Now we're looking at him and saying, well, are they still relevant? I think you can do it. But if you're not ready to hit the ground running or so to speak, I mean, you're, you're just taking kind of a, a hunch. And I don't see, I don't, it'd be interesting from Danielle and Katie, is there a backlog of management reform in the Congress just waiting for a president to say, bring it to me? Is that stuff out there? 
I, I just haven't been following it. I know GAO has an inventory, but are we ready, ready to legislate on this, Danielle? I would say the, the big reforms that, um, that I've been watching and we've been working with the Congress on tend to be what you would describe as those tinkering of fixing the existing Freedom of Information Act, the whistleblower protections, those things. Right. I wouldn't say they are these big, massive um, plans for reorganization that, that I've seen in the Congress. Have you, Catherine? Katie? You know, I'm, I'm sort of less um, aware of the, the reforms. Somebody like the Partnership for Public Service would probably be well versed in the reforms that are out there. Um, it sounds like you've created a job for yourself in a possible Biden administration, Paul. Is that well, what you're doing? Isn't that directed towards Tom or Danielle? Because I think, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I really, uh, I wonder about it. I'm not saying reorganization is the answer. I mean, uh, you know, I, we go there every uh, few decades and we say, oh, well, let's put this department together. And, and President Obama sought reorganization authority. He wanted to create a department of business. Remember this? He went to the house and he said, you know, give us, I think, I think it's our dear friend Tom Shoup who wrote the article for government executive on that uh, initiative. Uh, maybe. I mean, he did go to Congress and he did say, you know, I'd like reorganization uh, authority and, and the House said, absolutely not. And he walked and he just really didn't uh, follow through on another path. He just said, okay, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, Jeff Zients was ready uh, to move forward on a major reorganization package, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. yeah it has I, to be the political will. Yeah. Right. And presidents and administrations and people and members of Congress who push these kind of things tend to run at the very first sign of opposition. It was the interesting, one of the interesting things about the reinventing government effort in the Clinton Gore years, from the get go, they said, we're not going to do reorganization. The end re goal of this is not reorganizing because it's a dead end. Um, so, uh, the interesting thing is, the other interesting thing about the Clinton Gore years was, as I recall, they really thought there was going to be a political payoff from this. Clinton talked about it on the campaign trail. He made a big deal out of reinventing government and they didn't get any from in terms of the public paying attention. There just wasn't a lot of traction around it. So my question is, can this be a winning political issue for Joe Biden? Well, it can be a losing uh, proposition for him in re-election. Um, he can... Oh, you've uh, already got him elected. Well, let's say he is elected. Um, he, you know, I just foresee for him um, the potential for continued breakdowns of the kind where we're saying, there they go again. Now we have a Democrat and this agency or that agency is going under. You know, I think that the job here may be to get some of the people together, like Elaine K. Mark and the reinventors, uh, the folks in this meeting, um, and say, okay, let's get some traction here. Put GAO in the mix and see what we can come up with. We don't need a massive reorganization plan. We've got a real blessing coming, and this is coming from a baby boomer. The baby boomers are going to retire. I swear, my students don't believe that we ever will, but we are going to leave and create vacancies. What are we gonna do with that blessing as we think about how to reconfigure government um, as we have this generational passage? Um, I don't hear anybody talking much about it. Um, it's not a negative towards the baby boomers. We're always gonna be the greatest generation. Well, except for our parents, of course, who were the great generation, you get my point. We do have some big demographic events sweeping through governments at all levels in the coming 10 years or so that'll give us the opportunity to do some of this very difficult reorganizing and recalibrating uh, that I think we really need. And is it Joe Biden to do it? Um, is it uh, Donald Trump to do it? I think Donald Trump uh, doesn't really care much about it. And I haven't heard enough from Biden at this point to know where he stands on. 
I, I would like to make a little uh, plug though for what you're just sort of are describing as the tinkering, because I do think when you're tinkering with what I consider the good government infrastructure, yeah. I think that, that uh, has an exponential impact on the success and efficiency of government. So if we really could fix some of these systems like uh, the inspectors general system, making yeah. sure they're more, um, more independent and, and safer, uh, the whistleblower protection system, and this administration has also, uh, I think, really brought to the fore that some of our laws around ethics and government are inadequate, especially when it comes to the presidency and, and vice presidency. We need to be looking at those things that will give us a better confidence in, in what the government's doing. That's a really good, good point. I mean, we have coded all these statutes dating back to 1945, and there's one wrinkle in our monitoring that, that goes to your point, Danielle. The number of small new ideas being tested through statute in reforming government has basically cratered. We don't experiment much through legislation. Now, maybe it's happening somewhere else. What we have in recent uh, Congresses is an increase in the number of old, small ideas. So we are going to tinker and, you know, there are ideas that have been around for a long time. Maybe we'll try it with a little bit of a spin on it, but we don't have a lot of new ideas coursing through incentive structures and so forth. It's a very good point. They're, they're, yeah. It's a very good point. And I would just add that, you know, tinkering is better than nothing. So, <laughs> I mean, if you're not going to get massive reforms, you might as well tinker with it. Um, and I'd also say that, you know, for the Biden administration, if there is a Biden administration, you know, government reform isn't going to be first on their list. It's not going to be something that captures the hearts and minds of the citizenry. However, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. So you pick the issues that appeal most to the electorate, but then you're also at a lower level making changes to the government and reforming, you know, things that really, really need attention so that you can avoid, avoid future sort of disasters. Um, so I think, you know, you, you kind of have to set your expectations such that government reform is never going to be something that an incoming president is going to sort of highlight and showcase, but they can still do it. Yeah, it, it seems like over the last 20 years or so, the path to reform is to introduce legislation, push it, get a hearing or something, and then get it attached to the defense authorization bill. Yeah, that's true. It really is. The I, I'm also thinking though that Biden last night during his town hall, he was uh, bragging about his running the recovery during the Obama administration. Yeah. And that was a pretty wonky, uh, I mean, he didn't go into the detail that he did in some of his other uh, answers, but it was true. He was very much in the weeds working with the IGs and elevating the, uh, the transparency around, you know, the biggest outflow, sudden outflow of, of federal dollars that we'd seen in, in decades before, you know, maybe ever, right? Was that at the time was the biggest. Uh, and it was very successful. So I think that's a sign that he is embracing the idea of maybe being a successful bureaucrat is something that's politically valuable. Well, you, you had the, uh, uh, during the recovery, you had, you know, a particularly uh, prominent example of oversight by the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, uh, aka the RAT Board. Um, uh, and they did a heck of a job. So that, that is true. Uh, we didn't have the waves of fraud, waste, and abuse associated with the recovery um, that uh, one might have expected just from its sheer size. But so like yeah, I mean, what we're seeing now with the COVID relief. And, but, and who knows, the money's been pushed out so fast that you know, it'll take years to uh, uh, go through it. We'll see, we'll see. Is but would Biden be somewhat disincentivized to focus on reform purely from the stand? Well, from a couple of factors. One, he can kind of show up on day one and say and use his central campaign theme, which is basically, I'm not Donald Trump. Right. Um, and also, there is going to be an elephant in the room in terms of what he has to focus on because there's a pandemic going on. I mean, does that make him just less likely to focus on stuff like this? Well, you know, uh, Biden has said at several points during the campaign that everything's going to get better when Donald Trump leaves. He's even referred to it as an epiphany. 
Uh, and Donald Trump's departure, uh, if he's defeated, will lift morale, I suppose, and will uh, lift some of the burdens and so forth. But the basic structures and triggers that uh, we can trace into the recent cascade of, of uh, breakdowns, I, I don't see them going away. The, the real uh, uh, challenge for, for Biden is to identify the places where agencies are teetering on a possible nationally visible breakdown. Um, is it going to be over here? Is it going to be over there? Um, will it be in some far uh, away place? Will it be down the street? I mean, I look at the federal government and I say, you know, glory be to the federal employees who are going in and working it and the contractors who are dedicated to it and so forth and so on. But there are agencies out there uh, in the federal hierarchy that, you know, have very serious operational challenges. And Joe Biden's going to have to deal with this one way or the other. He can embrace it and say, I'm going to set up a repair shop here and we're really going to work on it. Um, or he can wait for it to happen. But I just don't see uh, the removal of Donald Trump from the White House being an automatic uh, source of high performance. It, it may lift people uh, in some agencies for a while, but I, I just see this kind of predictive path uh, towards continued breakdowns. And, and there's nothing that I've seen to, to de diffuse that um, that possibility. And I think even adding to that, there's been record numbers of uh, retirements across the federal government. So we've lost, you know, lots of expertise and institutional memory. And, um, you know, maybe one of the things that could happen if there were a President Biden is to restore people's faith in the idea of working for your government, ask what you can do for your country. And, you know, maybe it will revive that. But nevertheless, there's lots of vacancies to fill. Um, and you've lost you know, all of these people who had long careers in the federal government and extraordinary expertise. Well, I That's not be, a problem that goes away overnight. Well, I want to be like Danielle here. And I, I, there is a positive here in this mess, really. I think we can repair things like the, the inspectors general. We're, we're going to need them uh, and so forth. But I, I think this is doable and you have to do it every once in a while. Uh, you can't wait decade after decade, and, uh, lest you have this kind of flood of breakdowns. I think it's possible. I, I think there are many places that are still, uh, you know, uh, driving hard and producing excellent impact and results. Uh, we just need to get on the watch now and, and pay more attention to it and um, uh, work it. So we've got some questions coming in from audience members. And in the limited time we have left, I want to get to some of those. One is on size of government, especially after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, could you talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting this in terms of issues of the size of the federal government? Well, we were expecting in our analysis, our estimations that COVID and defense spending would both be significant drivers of increased contract and grant uh, headcount. Uh, COVID really did not have that effect. It was, it was a big chunk of money, but not that big. It's defense and transportation that has driven uh, the increases in federal estimated uh, contract and grant employees. Transportation grants, infrastructure grants, I mean, Donald Trump has been running a stealth jobs program for four years now. He knows and talks frequently about how important defense contracts are for stimulating employment. He knows how this works. All presidents do. Um, most of them don't simultaneously say we're going to use this spending to generate jobs and then say we're making government smaller, but so be it. Um, at any rate, we see a lot of activity here. And, uh, you know, the, the question is how accountable is the spending and so forth? I, I would like to add to that point, Paul. It's, it's maddening. You're absolutely right. The president's Democrat 
uptick and Republican have seen often the uh, defense budget as a jobs program, it's a very inefficient jobs program. If you're accepting the notion that we should just be spending money for jobs, there are many other sectors that, that uh, have a much better impact on creating jobs. So it's maddening that that's the one that is always the go-to, but you're right about it. I got to say that the thing that always comes to mind with uh, when we talk about this is that study that Pogo did 10 years ago. When I look at the contract and grant budgets, I think of cemetery workers, Danielle, you did that to me. The cost of a cemetery worker at VA versus a cemetery worker under contract and the contract cemetery grave digger is getting this and the VA grave digger is getting that. And we know that contract is not, contracts are not always efficient, but we know they create jobs. And Donald Trump uh, tweeted about this a couple of months ago saying, you know, I know that those new Raptor or what, whether it was the Raptor fighters or drones, I don't, I think it was drones, that he was like, you know, and we've created this many tens of thousands of jobs. He knows what's going on here. We spend money in defense and transportation, we get jobs. Now, is that the way we want to spend the money? Are those the jobs we want? That is a political and policy decision. I'm just, you know, we, we just do the analysis here. And he went to, he, he's very open a, about how the process works. I mean, he went to Wisconsin and said, basically, we, the Defense Department made a decision to build a ship here because it's politically advantageous to me for that to happen, which I think if that were true would make Daniela's head explode. <laughs> that, to me, that actually sounds like a re-election related behavior that happens to every president after the yep. midterm elections. They immediately figure out how to dole out government largesse John Hudak has a book about this, about the grants that are given to strategic swing states. It's been going on for decades. Uh, you know, uh, mentioning John, you know, he's been uh, so helpful uh, on this blog series that I did. And Tom McIntyre at NYU, who helped uh, set up this uh, webinar. Such, such good folks that I've uh, worked with, including Tom Shoup uh, <laughs> and his crew at, uh, at uh, Government Executive Magazine. First, first rate. Well, we're happy to help you out when you can't get your stuff published in the Washington Post. That's, uh, that's pretty much my go-to <laughs> option, yeah. <laughs> um, another question, might public financing of congressional campaigns ending the dependence of office holders on contributions allow Congress more freedom to reform government? Yes. <laughs> I, I see this money as fungible, I'm afraid to say, that, that uh, there's no amount of money that uh, people who are running for office uh, cannot imagine uh, being of use. So you'd have to figure out some way to monitor this, to discipline it. I, I'm just not sure. So the, the argument is if we give campaign financing to congressional candidates, they won't make any of these promises. I just don't see it happening, but I'm pretty cynical about it, I guess. I, I think in general, if we could uh, in any way uh, lessen the dependence elected officials have on raising private funds, it would help them have time to do their yeah. job. Okay. Yeah. And right now they're not doing their jobs nearly as well as they, they need to be. Because of that. Um. We're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to wrap it up by giving you the chance. One of the things you say, Paul, in the piece you wrote for government executive at the end of it, is that Joe Biden, if elected, should take a cue from Jimmy Carter, which is, of course, the advice that all Democrats <laughs> get. Well, that's your joke of the year, that's for sure. I think that's hilarious, yes. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean and why is that the case? You know, um, I went back to look at, you know, these epochs of, uh, of uh, reform. I have a very talented research scientist named G. Ding who came up with this analysis, computer modeling, and there are these epics. And one was anchored by Jimmy Carter. And I listened to his 
democratic uh, convention speech, acceptance speech, and it's just a beautiful piece of political rhetoric. Um, whether he was, you know, the right person to deliver it, I think so. But I was just struck by the way he kind of knitted this together that we are in the same period. It's, it's, we have come through an impeachment. Uh, there's been this bitter divide, this rancorous uh, uh, environment. And here cometh Jimmy Carter and he enters office and he brings forth this government as good as the people, lowering the barriers between government. And then he presents this agenda of major statutes that all of us here in this uh, conversation recognize. I kind of long for him. Like, where is Jimmy Carter's, um, uh, you know, uh, heart and soul in our conversations today? Will somebody please tell us what we need to hear? And I, I just think Carter's uh, 76 acceptance speech is a lost piece of profoundly important political rhetoric and policy um, promises. He, he was angry in the piece, in the speech and so forth, but it is still powerful rhetoric. And I think Joe Biden uh, could, uh, would do well to just listen to Carter talk about what we need to do in this post-chaotic uh, environment, if it's going to be uh, one that we get through well. And I would just add that if uh, Joe Biden takes Paul Light's advice, um, he should maybe wait to see what the election results are and maybe think yeah. about it later. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, uh, maybe this is a question for both Danielle and Katie. What, if you were advising him, what would be the first thing you'd tell Joe Biden to do on day one? in terms of this government reform stuff? Uh, I, I think that uh, my day one as Joe Biden would be to issue some executive orders that um, put in place a standard of ethics that has been lost and for his administration and a standard of uh, conduct that limits abuse of power, which we've also been seeing across uh, across the administration. Uh, I think that would that would be the first step. I think the stuff that Paul is talking about is not day one stuff, but I think it's hundred day stuff, and it 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 will involve legislation. So that means setting a legislative agenda that uh, reimagines how to make sure the the. Um, the agencies, especially as Katie has been talking about, many of which have been gutted, especially the science agencies, mm. how to revive uh, the, the uh, professional workforce and strengthen their capacity to speak truth and fact uh, so that the heads of those agencies will be best prepared to advise the president. And I guess I would say two things. One, I would say that he should designate somebody to sort of assess the damage and, and, and create a hierarchy of the damage that, was, that has occurred over the last four years and figure out ways to, to restore the independence and the integrity of our governmental institutions. Uh, so that's sort of one track. And a second track that's related, but um, maybe too specific, is that we're still gonna be in the midst of this pandemic. And I actually think that there should be some sort of 9-11 commission, but on a much smaller scale, which looks at, why are we where we are? What were the major mistakes that were made? Um, clearly, they're not all a function of President Trump. You can't blame the president for everything. Let's think through. I mean, this is not the first time it's going to happen to our country. We need to kind of think about where we went wrong and what we can do better next time. And it seems to me that at this point, we're just sort of living day to day and watching the numbers go up and down and up and down. But somebody needs to think more long term yeah. about how we address that. That seems like a good point on which to end the discussion since we've reached our time, unless there's anything you want to add, Paul? Just thanks to Tom. All of uh, Tom Shoup, Tom McIntyre, all the, the folks who uh, have helped uh, along this way and the Volcker Alliance for its early support of some of this research. Uh, these trend lines I intend to maintain for as long as I can. And every once in a while they speak, other times they don't. 
And that might be good advice for me, right, Tom? <laughs> no comment. Okay. Which is something you don't hear from a journalist very often. Indeed. Thank you to all of you and all of you in the audience who joined Thank us. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.